Today, we're going to show a very basic frame analysis on Need for Speed 2015 to show you how it handles photorealism efficiently on modern affordable GPU hardware. We decided to start this analysis series using this title because despite its notorious gameplay issues, it's an excellent instance where realism is enhanced by art style and atmosphere. In our opinion, these aspects are wrongfully portrayed as opposite spectrums, and when recent studios tried to attempt this powerful combination, they butchered the results with tryhard effects, like blurry, chromatic aberration, constant depth of field, film grain, and more like forced vignette. As a quick disclaimer though, we removed forced film grain from our Need for Speed gameplay, but we'll eventually go over how those effects should be used in limited scenarios. Okay. So we have the game running at 1080p with a V-Sync locked 60fps, with the following settings on an RTX 12GB desktop 3060. During high speed traversal, it used at most 51% of the GPU, and we had anti-aliasing turned off because it only offers a very blurry and smeary TAA, since one of the effects in this game depends on it. And the other option is FXAA, which has severe blurring issues compared to SMAA, which can be added using a third party injector. Okay, so here's the captured frame. It took a total of 9.12 milliseconds to process. We have some per-object motion blur running at the bottom here, and it looks nice, but we do have some further comments to speak about later on in the video. This game has very sleek color grading, and I kind of want you to appreciate how they use bloom and lens flaring here, because subconsciously that's really going to hone in that photorealism, because they did it in a way that's very realistic and not, not too cinematic, because cinematic is just a buzzword, really. What you're wanting is a dramatic tone, and that's exactly what they achieved of that effect. Now it does have chromatic aberration, but what makes it so great in this game is that it only uses a small pinch. So small that I actually had to zoom up on the game's image to confirm it was even there. Like you would with modern high resolution camera footage. It's only applied to the edges of the screen. So the middle of the screen where your eyes are mainly focusing on isn't harmed with visibility issues. Now, for the lighting, it has an aesthetic advantage due to only requiring a night only, where plausible shadows and ambient occlusion isn't going to need as pronounced representation. Some indirect lighting seems to be baked, but there are some modding tools that expose some of the more dynamic capabilities being used here. But the real star of the show here is the reflection system. It is screen space reflections, but it includes a very underrated aspect of realism, making it known as caustic SSR, or SSSR. See, most screen space reflections will either run on surfaces with a roughness value of zero, or apply zero roughness reflections on higher roughness materials, making them look wet or too shiny. What some games do for the second scenario is they offer blurred reflections for higher roughness, but it isn't enough since real reflections give specular elongation based on the viewing angle of surfaces. The Frostbite implementation of SSSR allows Need for Speed to replicate this kind of realism. But every masterpiece has its cheap knockoff, that being Unreal's SSR Quality 3, which displays obvious deviation from reference. This effect is more expensive because it needs more samples. So the original implementation required aggressive, flawed TA to hide low resolution pixelation. But thanks to a mod that was applied before our frame capture, it proves this TA independent version is a viable solution in both visual and performance standards on 9th generation hardware since we found almost no noticeable performance difference while testing, just improved visual quality. We're not saying that this mod just magically makes it better quality. We're saying it's just not going to be a noticeable difference on modern hardware. Okay, so this is the third game. So the first thing it does is recycle and overwrite these five textures called render targets. And these are used from the last frame. Here are the highlighted updates in the normal view. And here are the same updates in albedo without highlighting. Each piece of separate geometry is drawn to represent our forward motion. Multiple G-buffers are stored in these through the use of different RGBA channels, which record the object values like diffuse albedo, normal bias, and simple values like roughness, specular, and metallic that range from 1 to 0. Now these are all object draws in the pipeline, but this one right here took the longest. And if we look at the object, we can figure out why. It's a relatively simple object, but it's responsible for almost one third of the frame's shading due to the camera perspective. But let's compare this road mesh to a much more complex object in the background, like this one right here. Now it doesn't have much surface area presence on the frame, which is a big reason why it didn't take as long, but the material shader is a lot faster. And despite small triangles here, the performance damage from overdraw caps out. After drawing all the objects, 
it begins to prepare an optimized HBAO pass. The GPU creates several 270p buffers containing separate sampling information from the 1080p albedo alpha channel to extract the normal bias, and then does the same for the depth buffer. HBAO saves performance by running its expensive operations at quarter resolutions and using selective sampling. A 1080p AO buffer is then created. Then, a separate shader takes the noisy result and upscales the AO by referencing the detail visible in the original 1080p depth buffer, while copying the depth buffer into the green channel for later calculations. You can see that the AO begins to pronounce its influence on finer objects, but we still have some streaking artifacts. This is mitigated by a blurring shader applied in the next step in the pipeline. Now the HBO shader, the related buffer scaling, and the upscaling blur took around 0.8 milliseconds. Now we have HBO Plus, which is three times faster with double the AO detail. Think about the potential there. After the ambient occlusion pass is finished and until we get to this expensive chunk over here, all these little draws right here are shadow map drawings. And like I said in my last video, it's re-rendering several parts of the scene from the perspective of visible lights. And notice in each one of these, most of the floors are excluded. The reason why is because that surface area concept we mentioned earlier applies to shadow maps as well. So these lights aren't wasting performance on computing depth and opacity values for pointless floor objects. Okay, so let's get to the juicy area over here. It starts off mit mapping the depth, then retrieves the last frame's fully post-processed pre-UI mit mapped frame, references the roughness and normal values found across the original render targets, and the last frame's temporal SSR frame data to create the current frame's screen space reflection channel. The next step removes the noise in the screen space reflection channel. Next, the GPU begins to compute which lights are visible according to the camera's logical perspective and references a low resolution depth representation for further light culture. The GPU draws 41 128 by 128 mitmap cube maps to create a specular fallback for reflection. This large chunk over here is responsible for shading emissive materials, shadow maps, and their retrospective lights along with the bloom and lens flares. Then translucent objects are drawn. The GPU then pairs sky parameters like cloud shaders and the moon, which by the way is only 5x12x512. By 12 by then effects like tire debris is drawn, but a high resolution texture containing post-processing information and animation spirits are drawn. Then a mesh deformation shader is drawn with the velocity information so the motion blur can be calculated. Now here are some of my thoughts on the motion blur here. Okay, so I like what motion blur does for the bottom of the screen. It really does add a sense of velocity, but the bottom half is where it really belongs in the scene. There is so much wrong with the rest of this frame. Like you can see over here, if you zoom in, so much clarity is lost right here. Like what you can see right here, motion blur literally reconstructs a metallic bar right here on this bench. Who needs TAA when you have motion blur doing this for you? So much detail here is being destroyed. We really need to have motion blur that doesn't do this to the rest of the frame. Maybe by limiting it by depth or limiting it by, by speed. But this is a problem. This is a major problem and we need to stop allowing, because I'm pro motion blur because it's a real phenomenon. You know, several milliseconds of persistence blur, this is still a problem. If you're on black frame insertion or CRT or plasma, you know, you're still gonna have a negatively affected frame. Okay, so at this point, this is where the scene is mitmapped for the next frame's SSR reflection tracing. The final frame with film grain, chromatic aberration, and other effects are completed and finished off with UI updates. Now here's a quick breakdown of the rendering budget here. 1.15 milliseconds drawing geometry, 0.10 milliseconds drawing geometric decals, 0.80 milliseconds for HBAO, 1.95 milliseconds drawing 24 512 by 512 shadow maps, 0.80 milliseconds for drawing the screen space reflections, 2.18 milliseconds updating the light cooling information, environment specular lighting, and shadow map scene projection, 0.87 milliseconds drawing effect spirits and translucent objects, 0.07 milliseconds drawing lens effects, 0.07 milliseconds drawing rain lens effects, 0.36 milliseconds calculating mesh deformation velocity for motion blur, 0.12 milliseconds running post-process effects like color grading and vision netting, and 0.15 milliseconds drawing the UI. And we're going to overestimate and add in a 0.50 milliseconds worth of resource management and other shading information we couldn't translate well for the video. What are the things that you can learn from this? Number one, 
constant applied chromatic aberration should only be applied with a light touch. A practice you'll find from the studio is to offer an option toggle regardless of the platform. Number two, pay attention to your color grading and lens spirit effects because they'll have different but major effects on your atmosphere and tone. Number three, make sure objects taking up large amounts of screen space due to size or camera perspective are using cheap materials so your geometry timings are lower. Number four, you now know the realistic impact reflection scattering, elongation, and physically based reflection properties can have on your scene. We now showed it can run without a dependency on broken or flawed TA with a reasonable cost. Now you begin to understand the problems of UE5's implementation with SSR Quality 3 and other ridiculous scenarios you'd find with Cyberpunk. Number five, you have now witnessed how expensive ambient occlusion is ran at quarter multi-selective resolution and resulted with a stable output without flawed TAA, despite recent titles damaging your sense of visual and performance potential ambient occlusion could be providing today. The link in the description of this video provides undocumented information on how to replicate this effect in Unreal. But note, any screen space ambient occlusion is a limited representation of realistic global illumination. So there is still work to be done with ambient occlusion regardless. Number six, you now know the importance of shadow map object exclusion. It is a legitimate optimization technique used by AAA devs working with 8th generation hardware. But another thing that could save you performance and we couldn't confirm if it was implemented in this title, is to not redraw those maps if nothing dynamic or moving is included within the range of these lights. Number seven, if you were looking into cube maps, you now have an industry reference on how those are managed in one scenario. But we do feel that cube maps should be deprecated in modern development due to the gameplay related enhancements and recent performance workarounds for ray trace specular representation, whether it be sine distance field or triangle tracing. A lot of people are still calling ray trace reflections stupid. And they're right because they're not being implemented thoughtfully for both visual quality and performance. But in motion, cube maps in the most common scenario cause a jarring and largely implausible experience where ray trace reflections can fix that. And if implemented properly, can provide scattering and elongation for no performance cost when screen space reflection information isn't available. Number eight, if you have a game with a similar environment and scene limitations, you now have a reference that includes the resolution, hardware, and millisecond budget for your game. With this kind of budget, you have room for next-gen enhancements like deferred MSAA, ray trace reflection fallback, and better textures. If you enjoyed this video and learned something new, please support our channel with a like, subscription, or comment support, questions, or feedback to get the YouTube algorithm on our side. And if you really want to take a step further in supporting this kind of content, Share this video on a popular Discord server with Videos Channel or any game-related subreddit since these two platforms tend to prevent self-promotion but have a huge impact on our video view success. Well, that's it for today, and if you haven't, please check out this video exposing the manufactured visual problems and fake optimization in modern games. Until then, thank you for your support.